Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos from Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington. You'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, this is Ken McCarthy, and welcome to the Jazz on the Tube podcast. And this is where we like to talk about the future of the music. And, of course, the future of the music is education, the past, present, and the future. And whenever we can, we love to talk with performing artists who are also educators. And today we have a very interesting and exciting guest you're going to enjoy talking with. And before I reveal his name, some of you will know who he is by how I describe him is the director of jazz studies at Princeton University. And some of you may know that I, that I went there as an undergraduate. And at the, in those days, and I, of course I remember them very vividly, jazz was sort of in trouble. The club scene was gone, and so it was very hard for young people to get opportunities to play. And on the other side, the academic side had not developed yet. This, I graduated in 81. By the way, our guest was born 10 years before I graduated from college. And I wrote my thesis, believe it or not, on the subject of how will jazz continue without the, the jazz infrastructure. And I was really concerned about that because things were kind of bleak in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, so bleak that my college radio station was going to throw out the entire jazz collection, cancel the jazz programming, and make the station pop 40, <laughs> top 40 hits 24-7. That's kind of where we were in the late 70s, early 80s. So I just wanted to give you that little bit of background. Our guest, among many other things, is the Director of Jazz Studies at Princeton University. His name is Rudresh Mahatapa, and if you, if you read Downbeat, you know that he's won Best Alto many years now on that instrument. And he was born in Trieste, Italy, which interestingly enough is where James Joyce taught English and wrote Ulysses. Now, he didn't grow up in Trieste, grew up in, in Boulder, Colorado. So, Rudresh, welcome. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me, Ken. Yes, it's so amazing to me that my alma mater managed to snag you and get you <laughs> as, as, their, as the leader of their jazz department. Because we took, I, my roommate was Stanley Jordan, if, if you recognize that name, and when we were Absolutely. in college. Yeah, and so, so we obviously, we listened to a lot of jazz, like our whole life revolved around listening to music and playing and doing radio shows and, and all that. When, when we got credit, we got actual credit to, to take a jazz class. We couldn't believe it. We were like, this is amazing. How are we getting away with this? What was um, it? Was it a jazz history class? You know, it was wonderful. I'm not sh sure of the full name of the professor, but his, I'm pretty sure his last name was Berger. And he was a sociology professor. And he had a friendship with Benny Carter, the great alto player and, and band oh, wow. leader. And, yeah. And he somehow persuaded Benny Carter to come and teach a class for a semester. And what a wonderful experience that was. It culminated with a concert that included Benny Carter and alto. Dizzy Gillespie came and played trumpet, and Stanley got up there and, and uh, played guitar. So it was, that was a fun semester. <laughs> that sounds amazing. You know, I, I feel like I did see Benny Carter listed someplace as having taught here, and I just, I just assumed that it was a different Benny Carter, but now I, uh, I have some insight nope. into that. Pretty amazing. Nope. Now you know. Now you know the the back story. Yeah, that was, and it, and it was as if a spaceship. You know, because Princeton, at least when I went there, was just pure academics. There was. There was an arts program, but it was in an old public school building, kind of semi a lot of money into the infrastructure, and it just wasn't part of the mainstream of the school. It was something you kind of did way extra. And now it seems all these years later, the arts are taking a much more important place. But, but before we talk about, about Princeton, which I would like to do, I'd like to talk about their program. Well, I'm always curious how anybody manages, A, in this day and age, to find jazz, and B, to develop into an artist in, in, in the field. And it's always a sequence of events that, I, is, to me, it's always an interesting story. So you were born in Trieste, but you didn't spend much time there. 
No, my, my dad was on sabbatical the year that I was born. He's a theoretical physicist, and Trieste is very famous for the uh, Institute of Fundamental Research, which is a major theoretical physics research institute. So I ha- just happened to be born that year, but he had already settled in Boulder. He was a full professor at the University of Colorado. So, you know, we went home pretty soon after. Like, you know, I think I was in Trieste for a total of, you know, four or five months or something. Now, we don't think um, of, of Boulder, Colorado as a major jazz center, but maybe it is. Or, or how, did, how, did you, how did you find jazz in Boulder? Well, uh, you know, I, um, well, I, I should probably start earlier. So, you know, everybody plays recorder in elementary school, in elementary <laughs> school music class, and, and I really liked it. And I came home and told my mom, this is second grade, I came home and told my mom that I wanted private lessons. So she, she found me a private teacher, and so I studied, you know, Baroque recorder, I guess, for a couple of years. And then in fourth grade, our band program in, in school started, you know, that's when you were allowed to choose an instrument and, and join the, the school band. So my recorder teacher recommended the saxophone teacher just ended up being, you know, incredibly wonderful and highly influential and is still, you know, one of my best friends today. And he was a sophomore in college and I was one of his, if not his very first, one of his very first students ever. And and he was just a really eclectic guy and eclectic musician. He was into lots of different things and he played with lots of different kinds of bands. And so I would see him, you know, with a big band one night and then with an Afro pop band a different night and, you know, with a really wild trio with another horn player and a drummer playing, you know, quote unquote free jazz the next night. You know, it was he was into a lot of different things and you know, he would bring a few albums over. This is back in the days when teachers still came to your house. I guess they still do that a little bit, but I certainly never did that. <laughs> he would always bring two or three albums over and they'd be wildly different. You know, it might be you know, Ornette Coleman and Sidney Bechet and, you know, Yes. And then the next wow. week it might be, you know, Stravinsky and Charlie Parker and, you know, and, and a Beethoven symphony. And, you know, as I was listening to all this music without any kind of judgment, you know, I knew that it was all good. You know, so I, I at a very early age, I, I had a sense of the importance of, of having an individual, you know, unique personality as a musician. And also, you know, grew up not judging music stylistically in the sense that, you know, I didn't think of any style as being invalid or wrong. You know, it, it wasn't until I went to college when I actually heard people talk about hard bop and avant-garde. And, you know, I just, I didn't know, I guess I kind of knew what those things were historically, but I didn't really think about them as, as opposing forces, you know, Ornette was as important to me as Charlie Parker, you know, as was Louis Armstrong, as was the Beatles, you know, they were, they were all inhabiting the, a continuum of, of, of great music. So, so I studied with him until I, I left for college, but I was out there, you know, we were kind of an overachieving family. I was out there, you know, playing and doing as many things as I could pretty much as soon as I started playing. And, I don't know if you know, and maybe some of your listeners know that, you know, Boulder is, is famous for this pedestrian mall that, that has lots of, you know, musicians and street entertainers and, you know, magicians and savants. And, you know, it's a very lively place in the summer. And, you know, my dad, I, you know, I don't think he realized the monster he was creating. He said, you know, why don't you go out there and try to make a few bucks? <laughs> you know, so I went out there initially, like, you know, I think I was in junior high playing you know, TV show themes and, and butchering a couple of Charlie Parker solos. And, but that's something I continued to do until I left for college. And, and I met so many musicians that way and some people who really took me under their wing. The place I set up to play, there was, a, a, on Friday afternoons, there was a Dixieland band that played in a restaurant across the street. And I just w- went in to, to see them play and the band leader walked out. He saw my case, he saw me holding a saxophone case and, he came up and he pulled this list out of his pocket and said, do you know any of these two? And, you know, I ended up sitting with them, sitting in with them for, you know, on Friday afternoons for like four or five years. So, you know, so I knew Avalon and Undecide and Up the Lazy River. Like I knew all this very traditional jazz, jazz repertoire. But at the same time, I was listening to Michael Brecker and the Yellow Jackets, as well as Charlie Parker and Coltrane and, you know, I always had a band. I've always had a band since I was in ninth grade of, of some sort and tried to write music for that, too. And, 
And, you know, in the later years on, on the, the Pearl Street Mall there, I would actually bring a band down there with, you know, keyboards and drums and kind of like a, a quasi sort of fusion band. So, you know, all these things were kind of happening at the same time. And it was very clear that this was what I wanted to, to do with my life. And I'd also gone to various summer jazz camps and jazz workshops and, and the like. But then I started uh, school... I was kind of debating between University of North Texas, which you you know may know is mm-hmm. you know one of the top jazz schools in the country, and was the, actually the first state school to ever have a jazz studies degree. Sure. For me, it had come down to North Texas and, and Berkeley College of Music, and I went to North Texas first, and and did not have a very good experience, and ended up transferring to Berkeley. And there were some very particular teachers I wanted to study with at Berkeley. There's, there was a great saxophone teacher, not really a jazz teacher, but just a great teacher of the saxophone named Joe Viola, who many famous people have studied with. And Herb Pomeroy was very active at that time. He's a trumpet player who played with Charlie Parker and very brilliant composer and arranger. Hal Crook was teaching there at the time. He's an awesome trombone player that, that people probably know more from being uh, his, his time in Phil Woods Quintet. And, you know, so there were people who, you know, who I really wanted to study with and, and pick their brains. And, and then there were other people I took an odd lesson with along the way, David Liebman, Joe Lovano, you know, maybe a couple of other people in there. But, but, you know, all the time I was trying to write and all the time I still, you know, really had the sense of being, you know, wanting to be based in this great tradition, but, but not be, you know, a copycat or an emulator and, and you know, re- really take what has come before and, and, and try to make something new of it. And also at that time at Berkeley, I, I became, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Indian American and I, I think a lot of children of immigrants grow up with a sort of cultural confusion or that kind of slapped you in the face in early adulthood and you start questioning who you are. And for me, it was like, how Indian, in, how Indian am I? How American do I feel? How do I, you know, get these things to kind of work together. And, and Indian music was really a, a great way, particularly South Indian music, but Indian music in general is, was kind of a great way of of feeling connected to my ancestry and my heritage and, and trying to do something very interesting with that, as, you know, as it relates to jazz was, was also important to me. So, you know, it was that along with, you know, everything else. I mean, I was a big Charlie Parker head. I was a child of the 80s, so, you know, Twisted Sister and ACDC, you know, I was listening to the radio just like everybody else. Great. You know, I knew every saxophone on every Huey Lewis song, a saxophone solo, and everything on Top 40, you know, the Super Tramp sax solos, Huey Lewis saxophone solos, the, that weird solo on, on Money, Pink Floyd's Money, like, uh-huh, you know, I was uh-huh. trying to learn that stuff alongside, you know, learning you know, the head to Donna Lee. <laughs> so. And that's good. And that's good. That's good stuff too. I mean, that's, that's fantastic is, work. Yeah. Th- those solos. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, definitely. And again, it's about seeing these things in, in kind of the, the same plane. I mean, I guess, you know, through the eyes of, of someone young, they do exist on the same plane. And you know, I think it's only later that we start kind of drawing these, you know, these lines and, and these boundaries be- between these genres and, you know, and, and stop looking across the aisle. And, and it's easy to do. And I think the industry forces you to do that in a way as well. You know, you mentioned Ornette Coleman a couple of times, and I actually worked with him for a year in, in 1980, not musically, <laughs> on other stuff. And I wish. I had a chance, but I, I wasn't up to the task. But um, <laughs> he, 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 he was big on, he used to say, that, you know, eliminate the caste system. He actually used that word, eliminate yeah. the caste system for music. And I, I think most people that truly love music couldn't care less about boundaries. Absolutely. You know, you know it, I mean, you know, one of, the, well, one of the most telling things to me was, you know, I, I was artist in residence at the North Sea Jazz Festival a few years ago. And, you know, the, the, the organizers invited a, a few of us out to, to have breakfast together and then just hang away from the festival since it was, it was pretty crazy. And it was me and... And John Hendricks and Pharaoh Sanders. Mm. And it was amazing to me just, I mean, John Hendricks and Pharaoh Sanders were friends. And they were talking about, you know, they were going that memory lane together. And, you know, I think for most people, you would never think those, that those two would ever have inhabited the same space, you mm-hmm. know, when, when you listen to their music. But, 
You know, all these guys were friends, you know. Cecil Taylor was friends with Ella Fitzgerald, you know. I mean, just, yeah. you know, we kind of forget about that that sense of community sometimes that really is at the core of this music. There's a beautiful picture of Cecil Taylor with Mary Lou Williams seated at the piano together, and they look like old friends. You know, they were clearly yeah. comfortable with each other. Absolutely, yeah. case in point. And they, and they had deep respect for each other, you know. Well, Absolutely. They, they didn't resent each other's, you know, artistic missions or, or you know, styles or personalities, you know. They were, it was, yeah. So that's something that I, you know, I really try to instill in my students, kind of all of what I talked about, you know, this idea of unique personality and, 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 and artistic integrity and just the integrity and intent and, I mean, obviously everyone should be the best musician they, should possi- they could possibly be, but, I mean, if somebody is doing what they do at a, at a high level with real integrity and, and intent and heart and soul and intellect, and, I mean, it, you know, it's undeniable that the, the style and genre you know, those just go out the window, really. Those are not important anymore. I remember once visiting Ornette, and, and he was really, that week he was really into this cantor, this Jewish cantor. Someone had given him a CD of this guy singing, and he just thought it was the best thing he'd ever heard. He was raving about it. So, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing with him is, he, you know, he had this very open-door policy, and I think a lot of people did, actually, but, you know, He's of a, gen- uh, you know, he, I mean, he's passed now, but, you know, he was of a generation that, that still, yeah, I don't know, you know, kind of put forth this, this, this o- sort of o- literal open door policy. I mean, he, you, if he was home and if you came by with your instrument, he would invite you in to play. Yep. And I remember one time I asked him for his phone number and he said, well, let me give you my address instead. <laughs> and I just right. can't believe it, you know. Like, so, you know, and he, it was this wild amalgamation of musicians that would get together at Ornette's house to to, to jam. I mean, un, until, you know, until the very, very end of his life. I mean, I think, you know. And so to, to try to bring that sort of sentiment and and and, and welcome, welcomeness, that's not really a word, but that welcoming energy to the educational institution is, and, and, you know, it's paramount for me. Well, let, let's talk about that. But I want to ask two other things before we we get get there, if you don't mind. Sure. One, one is I've heard it said that, that you had a good reaction <laughs> to the music of uh, Bunky Green, the great Chicago saxophonist. And you spent some time in Chicago, yeah? I did. Those, But those things actually didn't overlap. Because when I was in Chicago, Bunky was, Bunky was long gone. He was already teaching in Florida, but yeah, the Bunky, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So I was warming up for one of my lessons and with Joe Viola, the teacher I was, had mentioned, and he, um, you know, and I was already, you know, working on a lot of different things and, and looking at different ways of kind of informing jazz vocabulary, looking at, you know, maybe some systems that come from 20th century classical music, some kind of non-Western sort of approaches and so you know i was always trying new stuff out and joe heard me warming up and he was just like he's like man that stuff you're playing is so great you know I, he, I, he said have you ever heard of bunky green and and i only had heard him by name as being you know he was very high up at the national association of jazz educators you know organization mm-hmm. and, but i only knew of him from that perspective i didn't really know his playing and he Joe had this closet of kind of almost like kind of secret things, and if he opened the closet, you knew he was going to pull something interesting out. And <laughs> and he had this this Bunky album called Places We've Never Been on vinyl. From it was on a, a on a label called Vanguard Records that, that did some really interesting work in the late seventies and eighties. And he loaned me this album. I, I went home and put it on, and I could not believe what I was hearing. I mean, it was really like everything I wanted to be. Like it was. It was futuristic, but completely based in tradition. And, you know, I heard Bird, I heard Bartok, I, I heard everything in his playing. And I was completely floored. And, and, you know, so this is pre-internet days. And obviously, we're, you know, we're talking about the early 90s, 91, 92, something like that. And, and I, um, you know, I was intent on getting in touch with Bunky Green. <laughs> so uh-huh. Uh-huh. I called, you know, directory assistants and whatever, and I, I finally got the office number for his, uh, his his office number down at University of North Florida. And I called him and said, man, I heard this record. It blew my mind. You know, can I send you a cassette of, you know, some of the stuff I've been doing? And 
and I did that, you know, and he called back two weeks later, and he said, he said, yeah, he said, you're definitely on the right path, you know, just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And yeah, he had some encouraging words, and then I ran into him a few years later at one of these jazz educator conferences. And at this point, I'm in Chicago. I'm in, I'm in grad school at DePaul University. All my uh, friends and colleagues at Berkeley were all moving to New York, and that did not seem like the right thing to do. I wanted to go someplace that was a bit calmer, and I, and I had a fellowship to do my master's at DePaul, so I just took advantage of going someplace else for a while. And So the DePaul big band was playing at one of these conferences, and, and, and I ran into Bunky, and I said, you know, do you remember me sending you this cassette? And he was like, ah, you know, not really. I said, well, you know, I'm... I said, I would love it if you came to hear me play. I'm playing with the big band. I have a bunch of solos, you know. And so every time I ran into him at the conference, I said, don't forget, you know, Sunday at 3.30 or something. And I was like, this annoying pest. And, <laughs> and you know, and then the band, we, we played. And Bucky was waiting for me on the side of the stage. And he was just, he was amazing. And he said, he gave me this huge hug. And he said, you know, there, there are four of us. He said, it's me and you and Greg and Steve. So he meant Greg Osby and Steve Coleman. Mm-hmm. And and he said the four of us have to take the alto saxophone into the future, and and we were friends ever since, you know. And then we we talked about trying to play together and maybe make an album together, and that scenario ended up lining up, you know, many years later. And yeah, and so we made this awesome record with Jack DeJohnette and Jason Moran and Francois Moutin. And yeah, I mean it's it, <laughs> it's been a long path with Bunky. He's been very, just, you know, just a great inspiration. And, you know, a lot of people don't know his playing. They know his name. But, I mean, he was a huge influence on a lot of the M-Base guys, you know, Steve Coleman and, and Greg Osby, Gary Thomas. And, you know, I, I think, you know, he's an incredibly important musician. And I'm really glad that we made that album and it got so much attention. Because I just think that Bunky deserved that, you know. He, he really deserved to have something that was out there in the world and, you know, we were on the cover of Downbeat together, and, you know, if, if I mean, I was more, I was just so ecstatic to see Bunky Green on the cover of Downbeat. Like, for me, it was like, you know, it should have happened three decades ago, but at least sure. it happened, you know, because now he's like 80, he's over 80 now, I can't remember how old he is. Yeah, I believe he was born in the, I believe he was born in the early 30s, so yeah, that, that puts him into the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. It's a funny thing about jazz, and and uh, yeah, I guess I'm, uh, Ornette's going to come up again. But uh, he would always tell me about amazing musicians from his youth. That he said, "Oh, that guy was as good as Charlie Parker," and right. but he never recorded, and he never left whatever town he lived in. And and I and, and I always tell people, jazz is a pyramid. You know, you see great players in Downbeat or or in the in the. Well, I used to I was going to say record stores, but now I guess I should say the iTunes store. But that's the tip of the iceberg, that there's so much more talent. So yeah. always keep digging. It pays to always keep digging. So when you hear the name, when you hear a name like Bunky Green, if you, if you don't know who we're talking about, go to YouTube or go to iTunes or go somewhere and, and, and check them out. You'll, it may change your life like it, like it changed, uh, like, like it changed uh, Radesh. Well, and you know, I, I, and, and it just, that, that what you described continues to happen. I mean, I know players who, you know, who are my generation that I, I think are some of the best players in the world. And you will never hear of them because of certain choices, you know, they have made or, you know, different, I mean, anything. I mean, life takes all sorts of paths. I mean, in Bunky's case, he was more interested in being an educator. That's what he focused on. Right. But, yeah, I mean, you know, the, uh, there's a guy named Aaron Stewart. He's a tennis player. I don't know where he is. I think he went back home to Northern California, but... I mean, for me, he was the, the best saxophonist in New York, uh, mm. hands down. But mm. no one ever heard of him, you know? And wow. he kind of he kind of kept it that way. And, and Emma Joviola used to say, man, there's always a guy. He's like, there's always a guy that plays better. You know? and I, I really <laughs> like that. There's, there's always a guy that plays better, not only better than you, but better than the person you think plays the best. There's always a guy. And every town has their guy. That's the, one that, that's the thing that he said that I love. He's like, you know, you pull up in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest, and there's some guy who's playing stuff you've never heard in your life. You know? <laughs> yes, there you go. And there you go. I, I think of Von Freeman maybe as an example of somebody who didn't really leave Chicago much. And he's a stra- extraordinary. Just, Absolutely, and and yeah. that who I that was my guy in, in, in Chicago. Vaughn Vaughn led a, two or three different jam sessions around town, and we got to know each other very well. And he was 
incredibly supportive and, and encouraging. And I was really flattered. Like he was headlining the Chicago Jazz Festival for his seventieth seventieth birthday, I think. Was mm-hmm. it seventy fifth? I don't think. And and they said he could play with anybody he wanted. And, and you know, and he, I was one of the guys he chose to play with him on that gig. Oh. And, yeah, and that was really great. Dijonette was on that gig actually. Yeah, it was really. You know, he he was a very very special guy, amazing person, amazing musician. Well, let's talk about Chicago, and let's talk about the idea that New York may not be the best place for a developing young jazz musician to go right away. Let's take Stanley Jordan as an example. He arrived at Princeton at 18, and he was already burning the paint off the walls. I mean, he was unbelievable, and he right. was very nervous. He was very nervous about going to New York. He didn't do it while we were undergrads. And he only put his toe in very gingerly in the first couple of years after graduation. And there may be a good reason for that. Maybe you could talk to that a little bit. Well, I mean, I think people need to listen to, you know, what their heart is really telling them. I mean, I think, you know, New York is not for everybody. And, you know, I've been in New York or the New York area for over 20 years, and I'm still not sure if that's right for me, you know, I think. I mean, for me at that time at Berkeley, like it was, it was almost like it was, it was a prescribed path that you, you know, you went to one of the big music schools for your undergrad, and you moved to New York either to just try to play, or you would try to do your masters at one of the schools, or you know, something like that. There was like this preordained path, which I'm always very suspicious of of, of any preordained path. And what I saw was. Well, I'd gone to New York a couple of times for, like, long weekends and hated it. And, uh, I mean, for me, it was like a 72-hour panic attack. I couldn't wait to leave. And But what I really thought was that, you know, beyond that from a logistic point of view was that I, I would become so consumed with making ends meet, trying to figure out how to make ends meet, that, that music – that the music would become secondary. And it actually mm-hmm. did become secondary to a lot of, you know, my fellow classmates. Like, their day job became their real job, and, you know, and they're actually really not playing that much anymore. And, and you know, and they were good musicians. When I look at, you know, with, with you know, the, the hindsight I have now. And, you know, my attitude with Chicago was, okay, well, I have this opportunity to do my master's, which will be beneficial later on if I am looking at, you know, some sort of teaching scenario. And at that time, no one was offering a doctorate in jazz. I think some, some places are doing that now. But I also just wanted to play, just play, play, not not play necessarily jazz or original music. And I did a lot of stuff. I played with salsa and merengue bands. I played with R&B bands. I played with blues bands. But all the while, I was leaving my own band and writing music. And a small local record label put out my first album. And, you know, a lot of things happened in those four years that would have never happened in New York. And, that you know, when I came to New York, I had... I had a lot of musical experience, but I also had a life, a lot of life experience. And I knew how to go talk to a record label. I knew, I knew how to get a radio station to play my album. I, I knew how to make a flyer. You know, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. stuff that seems pretty mundane. But you know, if you just moved to New York right from Berkeley, I mean, Berkeley doesn't show you how to do that stuff. I, I think they might now. I think a lot of music programs are, are require, you know, have, you know, installed some sort of business education component to what they do and, and I'm kind of glad they have but at that time at that time no one was doing that you know so I felt like I really had a leg up when in, in just spending four years someplace else and I think now it's very different just because of the speed of communication and the internet and you know I think it's very possible to to create a strong local community and still reach the rest of the world. You know, that, the, the main thing with New York back then was that it was the gateway to the rest of the world. Like, you were never going to get to Europe and, you know, and play festivals and whatever. You were never going to play with Jack DeJanet. You were There are all these things you were never going to do unless you moved to New York. And I don't say that's entirely untrue now, but, it, but it's mostly untrue. You know, you can, you can really have a great career elsewhere, you know, as long as you kind of you stick to your guns and you're somewhat savvy. I mean, even when I was in Chicago, the only two guys that really had kind of big or well, they weren't the only ones, but some of the few were like Fareed Hawk, who's a great guitarist who was on Blue Note for a while. Howard Levy was the harmonica player, was Bella Fleck for many years. I think he's he's back again. 
total virtuoso, great musician. Some of the guys in the AACM, but but the people who were actually the number of people who were actually out there doing stuff on an international level, it was really like ten people. I mean, out of mm-hmm. the whole jazz scene in Chicago. So mm-hmm. so you still had to move to New York mm-hmm. back then. So you know, I arrived in New York in '97, but. But that's the thing, you know, when I go and do workshops around the country, you know, there's often this conversation about New York and is it important to move to New York? And I think you have to know what it is you're trying to achieve if you, when you come here. But at the same time, I also think that everybody should spend some time here because this is where, this is still the, the place where all the greatest players are for the most part. And and just the energy of the city. I mean, this is where all the great musicians cut their teeth, you know, and, mm-hmm. and to plug into that kind of, that continuum of this music is important. But I don't think you need to spend your whole life here, you know, unless, you know, the stars shine on you appropriately. And I think it's even more important for European musicians because they're dealing with this American art form, African-American art form in kind of, a void of sorts of, of kind of direct influence. And so I always tell them they should, they should all come and spend it. If you're going to say that you're really playing jazz, come and spend a year or two in New York and experience mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So, but, they but they can also, question, they can also try, I don't know if you've had a chance to spend much time there, but they can also try New Orleans as a place to plug in to that energy. If, I think if, so. You know, I haven't spent a whole so, lot yeah. of time there, but I think, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of validity to that. And I think it also depends on what it is that you're you're going after artistically. But, you know, one way or another, I think that you have to plug into the the American jazz experience at some point if, if what you're really doing is playing jazz. Speaking of, of plugging into it, another experience, you spent some time studying in India, studying Carnatic. Is that how you pronounce it? Carnatic? Yeah, mm-hmm. Now, I, I actually, this is, believe it or not, Prince, Princeton did not have ethnomusicology when I was there. I don't know if it, if it does even to this day, but I was really interested in that. And Douglas College, which was part of Rutgers University in New Brunswick, did have a department. And there was a course in Southern Indian music. And I used to take the bus from Princeton to New Brunswick to take that class. I, I loved it. And I played a little violin. And it, I was so intrigued that you could, that there was a way you could sit on the floor and play violin. It was just very interesting to me. Now, Carnatic music is in, is is improvisational, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the framework is different, but but yeah, it's definitely you know an, an art form that that deals with a lot of improvisation and and also deals with just a lot of you know rhythmic propulsion. And I mean, I see a lot of commonality between you know a, a great South Indian percussionist and, and Max Roach. You know, I mean, I mm-hmm. think. Again, we talk about these things kind of in, in, inhabiting the same space. I mean, I, I definitely hear that. I mean, my study there, so, I mean, that's kind of a different story. It's a, it's a little bit like the Bunky Green story where I had heard that there was a Carnatic saxophonist named Kapri Gopalnath. And, again, we're talking, you know, early 90s, no Internet. He had one CD available in America, and, and some of these Indian music CDs have horrible titles. And this one was actually called Saxophone Indian Style, which you can probably use that. <laughs> and my brother, older brother, had actually bought it for me as a joke. And he gave it to me. I was like, oh, my God, you found an album by this guy. Like, this is amazing, you know. Wow. And, and what was, that was important to me because I was listening to a lot of Indian music. And I'm figuring out how to emulate a lot of that on the saxophone was just, just really difficult. I mean, the, the way the vocalists can slide around and ornament notes or even the, the violin players for that matter flute right. players oh yeah some of that is just mechanically very difficult to figure out how to do on the on the saxophone and so oh. with, with Kadri's album with that album I felt like I could play along with it like the way I was playing along with Coltrane records and I could also hear what he was doing technically like oh he's doing that by doing this on the horn and it sounds like he's doing this with his mouth or you know whatever and so that album ended up being very important to me. And so, you know, fast forward a few years later, I'm already living in New York, and I hear that Kadri's on tour in the U.S., but he's not playing in the New York City area, but he's playing in in Boston. And my older brother lives in Boston. And I was like, okay, well, I can I can go crash with him, and I could drive up and see the show. And this is like the early 2000s, maybe 2003 or four, And... So I drive up there and I get backstage to meet him and 
I, you know, I introduced myself to him on the saxophonist, and, and he was so intrigued that there was someone of South Indian origin playing jazz saxophone. And then he was also just intrigued by my name. My name, the roots of, of, of both my first and last name are, have very, are very powerful to the Sanskrit roots, the, 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 the relationship to Hindu mythology. So he loved my name. And I gave him this album, and, and he said, you know, maybe we can do something together sometime. And so I was like, yeah, you know, that would be amazing. And to this day, I don't know if he ever listened to that album that I gave him. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's still sitting shrink-wrapped, you know, in his <laughs> house. But you know, then I ran it to my friend Rachel Cooper, who was performing arts director at the Asia Society. And she was like, you know, are there any interesting projects you're thinking about? And I said, well, you know, I'd love to do this thing with Kathy Gopalnath. And she was like, you know, I was just in India two weeks ago, and I heard him play, and it was amazing. Like, what do we need to do to make this happen? So so we worked on it. We raised a bunch of money, and we ended up we ended up making this thing work. I spent, I went out and spent a couple of weeks with him, and we kind of sketched out this music that we, I guess, co-wrote in a way and, and put together this very hybrid group of jazz musicians and Indian musicians and and. And we just played, we played three nights in New York and one night in Philly, and it was really great. Hmm. And then a few years later, we're like, well, you know, we should try to do that again and maybe record and try to do more shows around the country. And at the time, you know, there was the whole payola scandal between the record labels and radio stations and all that, and every state settled differently. And the way New York State settled was, you know, they got several million dollars, and it all went into a fund that was, you know, grants by application, but they had to spend all the money in two years. So they were giving out these really fat grants for projects as long as they took place in New York State. And so that and the Rockefeller Foundation, a few other sources kind of came together. And and we were able to do seven or eight big shows around the country, and we made an album in the middle of that. And, yeah, and that album ended up being wildly successful. That was that was what got me on Fresh Air with Terry Gross. It was, you know, it was like in the top ten on Amazon for weeks. Not not Amazon Jazz, but Amazon. Period. You know, like it really, really, really yeah. wow. It was on the the top ten on iTunes Jazz for like I don't know two or three months or something. Like yeah, so, so that we really really we, well. Do you think you were getting buyers in the United States and in India? Because that's, that's two big countries right there. Uh, I don't think we markets. were getting buyers in India. I think, I, I, I think the, the buyers are mainly Western European, oh, okay. American, okay. Canadian. Yeah, I think that was... That's awesome. Yeah, and, and so that was... Uh, that, both that kins, was that Kinsman? That's Kinsman. So uh, the actual study part is, is, was actually later. Later I got the... A few years later, I got the Guggenheim Fellowship for this very specific project. To what I wanted to do was study some very specific melodic and, and rhythmic aspects of, of Carnatic music, and but take those and graft them onto essentially like a, a jazz rock fusion group with electric bass and, and electric guitar. And, and I was also part of the project was also learning some audio processing software and implementing oh. that too. So. So that was this really informal study. I mean, part of it was with Kadri, and I just went to his house every day for a, especially a month, and we just worked on a different thing every day. And then, and then I worked with this amazing percussionist in Bangalore, and it was the same thing. I went to his house every day for a month. And so there were these very kind of almost like informal conversations, and, and I just kind of recorded everything. And, and the idea was to take all of this, and I would have a lifetime of stuff to, to work on, as opposed to you know, going and spending 10 years in India and studying. But, so that all resulted in, in an album called Sambi, uh, which unfortunately kind of flew under the radar because we did a bunch of gigs. I mean, we toured for a few years before the album ever came out, and then I think, yeah, it was just a weird scenario. But, but some people have that album. I'm very happy with that album. There's actually a great recording of that, a live recording of that band, that you can listen to on on the NPR Music website that was uh, from the Newport Jazz Festival. So, but yeah, that was that was kind of how that went. But you know, I mean, the like Bunky Green project and other projects that were actually kind of around the same time or in development at the same time. So I'm always kind of in a few different places at once. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I I, I imagine. And Samdi is S A M S A M D H I, right? For yeah, mm -hmm. S A M D H I. 
Cool. And just one, one little, one last thing about this. Everybody says, oh, jazz is improvisational music. But I, but I always say, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of improvisational musics all over the world. Carnatic is one of them. North, there's a lot of North African music that's improvisational. Irish music's improvisational. It, it goes on and on. So maybe, and I'm, I'm bringing this one out of left field, but may, maybe you could help define what jazz is then. If It's not just improvisational music because then all kinds of other musics would would fit into that category or yeah, it's definitely not that. I mean, it's obviously coming out of this, you know, this African American tradition of, you know, taking, you know, traditional aspects of, of primarily West African music, I would say, but and I think that's such a debate. And, you know, so you have these people at the ter- turn of the century that that have lots of music in them, but what they have access to is these Western instruments and and you know and Western music, which is you know kind of Tin Pan Alley and you know these these tunes. So you have all these things kind of happening at once that kind of that, that make this music happen. So, which is why it's intrinsically American and why it's you know intrinsically African American. And you know it's like you know it essentially was improvising on on what at that time was popular music. I mean, we often a lot of the students forget that what these jazz standards, these old tunes were actually I mean, that was popular music. You know, right? Like, you know, it's. It, you know, when Herbie Hancock does, you know, does an album where he's playing on a Nirvana tune, you know, he's essentially doing the same thing, you know, that the, the folks sure. were doing back then. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing really odd about that. And, you know, and the attention to rhythm, I think, I mean, rhythm is a very interesting thing. I mean, I think that there are lots of improvised musics that, that are less concerned with rhythm, but but that's why, like, Carnatic music and jazz and, and some African music and, you know, the, that sense of rhythmic propulsion and, and the interaction with, with percussion is, you know, I think something that's very special and, and unique, a few of these things that we call improvised music, but, you know, but especially jazz. Yeah, I think some people who maybe not who are maybe not as knowledgeable, when I remember when Miles was doing electric music and he'd, and he'd do Cindy Lauper tunes, <laughs> and and he and, and it's like wait a minute, but he said, of course he's doing that. That's what do you think he was doing in the fifties? You know, what what do you think? My someday my prince will come. That that wasn't a jazz standard, right? Yeah. So exactly. so the tra- the trans the transmutation, I guess, of of just sort of straight pop tunes into works of art is a big part of jazz. And then there's something about American jazz too, where it's able to absorb or play with other forms you know for instance you going out and and studying carnatic music and then being able to bring some of that into jazz i think that's one of the things that makes american jazz unique in that it's wide open chano pozo, chano pozo comes up from havana with with all this amazing conga music let's do something with that and next thing you know you have manteca and and you know it's just it, it's something about jazz i find american jazz unique in that its ability to play play well with others i guess is well, I mean, it, it welcomes hybridity, you know, at, at yeah, at, at at its core. I mean, because it's born out of hybridity, right? It's not. Yep. We, we're not dealing with. I mean, that's the difference with when we. I mean, that's a great, huge difference with a lot of these improvised art forms that we talk about. Like, I mean, Indian classical music is thousands of years old and doesn't really engage, you know, hybridity at, at this point. And. You know, jazz. I mean, that's what that that's one of the big things about the American, uh, you know, American with a capital A. Is I mean, you have a country of immigrants and 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 displaced people in some cases, and and that's what the, the music is born of. And and what's important about that is not only the, the musical manifestation, but it's it's that this music ends up being a way of telling a story of of communicating. Uh, of uh, oppression or or cultural hybridity or, or you know or displacement and it ends up being this this, this way that many people can talk about their experience with, with w- without the you know fear or you know the barrier of some sort of exclusivity and I think that's you know that's why it makes sense to me perfect sense to me why an Indian Indian American kid growing up in Boulder Colorado gravitated towards jazz. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting that you use the word story, and it always makes me think of Lester Young, you know, one of the, one of the great stylists and I would say philosophers of jazz of all time. And, and his dictate always boiled down to tell me your story. Right. Tell me your story. Exactly. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hear, you know, chromatic scales up and down at high, you know. Right. Hey, let's 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 talk about your Princeton story. Now, you, how long have you been affiliated with Princeton? 
that I am finishing my second academic year here in, in a few weeks. Oh, okay. I, I always I always liked living I liked living down there I loved the it, it's sort of much more built up than it was when I was there but still it's it's very countrified there's beautiful trees the trees on the Princeton campus are amazing and they're probably all flowering now what's tell me a little bit about the program and and how it works and what's going on there and well I mean I, I think it's very interesting I, I arrived at an interesting time and and I have to tell you that I, I wasn't really looking for an academic position. I mean, I wasn't like, like I have friends and colleagues, but, you know, every year they're applying for, you know, every academic job that, that fits what they do. And I definitely wasn't one of those guys. Mm-hmm. But I saw this position come up, and, and I was more aware of Princeton's, you know, world-class composition and, and musicology programs. So I, didn't, I wasn't really aware of uh, not only the jazz program, but just any sort of performance arm to to what they were what they were doing, and you know, but it ends up that you know Princeton really has has put a lot of paid a lot of attention to you know the the performing arts, and so I came here at, you know at a really good time where that is you, you know I think it, I've heard that you know the performing performing ensembles were kind of treated like the illegitimate children of the music department, and that is that's certainly no longer so. You know, we offer a few classes, but but primarily still all the, and you described this in your experience, you know, most of the performing groups are extracurricular still. And, mm-hmm. you know, oftentimes when someone, you know, when I'm telling, explaining that to somebody, they're like, oh, well, did the kids show up? It's like, well, yeah, they always show up because actually <laughs> they're not required to be here. They're doing it because, you know, they love to do it. So they're actually... Sometimes I think they're actually more diligent and dedicated than, than students at a music conservatory, which is, you know, really great. And very few of them are, are actually have eyes on doing this for a living, which is even more interesting because, you know, we can talk about this music in many different ways without having that burden of, oh, my gosh, I have to figure out how to make sure this guy's going to be able to make a living playing music when he gets out of here. Like, that's that's less of a concern. So... That just gives us a lot of latitude. We can talk about the music from a social perspective, from, you know, different sorts of historical perspectives. We don't necessarily have to talk about how, how the swing pattern happened. Like, we can, we can also talk about this music as, as, a, as a means of protest and a, and a means of communication, as you and I were just talking about. And we can do really interesting things. You know, one of the things I've wanted to do that, that I've been doing is, is having really interesting guest artist residencies where... I mean, I think it's very common with a lot of college and even some high school programs where, you know, some jazz star comes in the day before and, and rehearses with the big band and then you play a concert the next day. And and that just seems very unproductive to me. I don't know who that's actually good for. And so I'm more interested in bringing musicians here for a week. And we really get to, you know, rehearse and play, but also get to hang out and you know, have a lot of engagement with, with the guests. And I think that ends up being a much more fulfilling and, and inspiring experience. So, you know, we did that this year. We did that with Anila Perez and oh. and Archie Shep. We had Archie Shep in oh, for a nice. week in December. And the big band played wow. the Attica Blues Suite with him. And Amina Claudine Myers was singing and playing piano. And wow. the massive production with the string quartet and the small gospel choir. I mean, it was it was amazing. It was, yeah, I mean, getting chills thinking about it again. It was, I mean, I can't believe we pulled it off. We also had Gerald Clayton, the great young piano player. Oh, yeah. Here last fall. Last year we, and one of the things we're trying to do is, is commission more work, too. So last year we commissioned a, a big band piece from Billy Childs, who's a great piano player based in L.A., who's, who's won a ton of Grammys. And I mean, we actually renamed the big band the Creative Large Ensemble, because I think we want to, we want even the name to reflect that you know that we are seeing beyond the boundaries of, you know what the big band has has been historically, but still paying attention to all that pr- tradition. I mean, for me, I think you should be able to you know, you you should be able to play Mary Lou Williams and, and someone like you know John Hollenbeck, uh, you know one of these modern large ensemble com- composers. You should be able to play all this stuff on the same program and, and really be able to express how all this stuff relates to each other as opposed to doing doing an evening of all count basie or something like i think it's it's more important to to in real time express the fact that the the way you express the present of this music is by looking having one foot in the past and one foot in the future 
So this coming year, let's see, what do we have for next year? Ambrose Akinmusare, who's who's one of the big trumpet stars of, of Blue Note Records, awesome musician, composer. He's going to, we're commissioning a piece for the top small group from him for the 150th birthday of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Hmm. And then in the spring, we're going to have Carla Blay and Steve Swallow here, and we're actually commissioning wow. a, a piece from, Carla's going to write a, a piece for the big band, and, and we're going to do a whole night of her music. So, you know, we're wow. really, I think I think we are doing some of the most interesting thing with jazz in, in the, you know, institutional setting than, than, you know, than almost any other <laughs> program in the country. It, you know, it, just it, it, sound, it sounds but, like it. No, it, it really sounds like it. Yeah, because you you you're like it's sort of this theme from throughout the call. There's there's some freedom to not be not slot yourself into some strict boundary. You know, we're only going to do big band jazz, big band music. We're going we're going to look at the whole musical palette and the whole musical experience. And I love that you can bring the artist down for a week. Well, yeah, and you know, I mean, that's amazing. And, and fortunately, it's because you know I have these great resources at Princeton to do so. And and I don't know. You know, if you've been by recently, but you know, we we have this new this new music building that's in- incredible. We have this whole new Lewis Art Center complex that so we have amazing acoustically perfect rehearsal rooms and practice rooms and yeah, so it's it's pretty amazing. I mean, we have a lot of great resources. A lot of people are are, are really kind of amazed that that all this stuff is actually. Is happening here. The other thing that I'm working on for a year from now, for April of 19, is actually having a, a jazz festival on campus. Uh, uh. Like maybe like a five bill, you know, five band bill outdoors and, and a big headliner indoors. And, and the headliner who I have blocked, assuming I can get all the other elements together, I can't say by name because it's not confirmed, but, but it's a really, really huge headliner. It would be such a coup if it happens. But I think it's going to happen. So I, I, I bet it will. Um, I used to put on concerts myself down there, uh, and, and I always found it to be a very, not only the campus, but the off-campus area too, the, both communities, were very open to music. I had, uh, this is years ago, so people may not recognize some of these names, but I had Anthony Davis come down oh, yeah. uh, and do solo pian- piano, and, and we sold every seat. You know, we, we right. sold that thing out. I had Jerome Cooper, the great percussionist who passed away recently. Yeah. He came and did a solo thing. And again, there wasn't a seat in the house. It was, it was standing room only. So I found that if you got the word out down there, and even though it's sort of a suburban, you know, suburbanish, r- ruralish area, if you got the word out, people would definitely come out and check stuff out. And they, they had pretty big open ears. Yeah, I mean we we're definitely rolling. I mean, when I, we, I want to be rest- oh, I was Go just going to say, you know, when we when we like, you know, the Danilo show, and again, it's like these guys are not playing with their bands; they're playing with the students. You know, I mean, Danilo, I think we had like four fifty, five hundred people. Wow. Archie Chef was sold out, like eight hundred and whatever people. Wow. You know, I say. So I've been that I've been very proactive about making sure what we're doing is reaching out to the community. You know, we. We do some concerts at the Princeton Public Library. We just did one this past Sunday that was packed. We also ha- have a band playing at Communiversity, which is this big outdoor music festival that happens actually this Sunday, but it's the, the last Sunday of April every year. And, you know, and, and real, yeah, real outreach, real mailing list. I go on WPRB, the, the radio station. I bring my guests down there and whenever they're here. And, yeah, I mean, I, I'm treating the whole program like it was my own band and my own gig. You know, I don't want to... <laughs> I don't want to play to an empty room. <laughs> I don't right. want to, so I've taken all my kind of DIY. I mean, fortunately, I'm not DIY anymore. I have agents and a manager and all that. But I was DIY for many, many years, and I, I've just brought that all, all that energy to Princeton. Like I, I have my own publicist for the program, who is actually my publicist, is really fabulous. So you know, the show with Archie actually got reviewed in Jazz Times. I don't know if that really happens for a student show anymore. Oh wow. Wow. Well, I'm I'm I was an expert at postering on the Princeton campus. If you if you ever need any pointers, I, I put up thousands of posters <laughs> down there. And by the way, that that remains to be one of the best ways to get people to come out. Is just a, for anybody listening, any musicians, get your flyers up everywhere, and you will you will get people at your shows. It's just, you just have to do the 
the firing, postering. Yeah, Ooh, that's a full time job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. You can get very fast. You know, just it's like you can get fast doing runs on the saxophone. You get really fast putting up posters. <laughs> but hey, uh, Rajesh, this has been fantastic. Better that better than even than I hoped, and I hoped I hoped a lot. Where can people find more if they want to follow your music in particular? I think the best way is my website, which is rudreshm.com. That's R-U-D-R-E-S-H-M.com. And I just released an album last fall with a trio I've had for many years called the Indo-Pak Coalition. It's a trio with guitar and, and Indian percussion. And this is our second album. Our first album was almost 10 years ago, actually. And so I actually did an experiment in self-releasing and, so that's available there and only there is another exper- experiment. But the download is only 250 for the whole album. And we also mm. have double LP. And we have shot glasses and socks. So please <laughs> check all of them out. You can't, you can't have a band without shot glasses and, and socks, so I always say. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> Merch, you know, you got to have merch. That's, some of the, that's pretty creative merch, merching there. I, I, I like that. I don't usually sit around reminiscing about Princeton, but um, today I'm thinking about it in very positive terms. I think that they're doing, they did the right thing by inviting you down there to take charge of this. And I know, I know there's a great audience, and you're discovering that yourself, and the idea of the students getting to play with these great musicians and getting to hang out with them a little bit over time. Not this, as you mentioned, this sort of they fly in Friday, play Saturday, and they're gone Sunday morning. You know, which which has its place, but it's so much better. I th- again, I think of the time that we got to spend with Benny Carter over the period of a semester. It's very an educational, very informative, and we absorbed a lot of lessons. This probably couldn't get any other way. So right. your website address, I believe, is r u d r e s h m as in Mary dot com. Correct. So Rudresh M dot com. Hey, thanks a lot, and keep up the good work. All right. Thanks a lot, Ken. It was really great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.